much, Hal. If I can have all my pa panelists up here, we'll now start the audience participation part. Um, I heard a lot of agreement, particularly heard agreement on uh, an equation which I can express as investment is inversely proportional to uncertainty. So the more uncertainty... Be, there, there are a variety you, of things. I don't, well, I, it's, I, not, I don't, it's not the only thing we heard, yeah, but there right. certainly is a lot of concern about yeah. the regulatory uncertainty and how that affects investment. Um, so this is your chance. If you're online, we have uh, a Twitter handle, IPF Broadband. That stands for Internet Policy Forum. And do we have a question already? Have a you have a question. Okay. And I, I have a requirement. Everybody has to introduce themselves before they ask their question. Hi, David Vior, Stysock, DC. Two yeah. questions. First for Blair. Um, doesn't the prisoner's dilemma assume no communication or lack of information between the two pres prisoners, and wouldn't yeah. that be not applicable to competing telcos or ISPs knowing what the other is investing in? Well, the prisoner's dilemma game, the way it's generally played is uh, that there is no communication. Right. But it then relates to the level of trust. Right. It probably would be an antitrust violation for the cable entities and the telcos to discuss their investment plans, but the truth is they have to discuss those things publicly so they, they know, they know them. Though. They know what their plans are. Right, right. But my point is what, what we saw and what was obviously true was because cable had both the better network and the cheaper upgrade path, it did not make logical economic sense for the telcos to do the fiber unless there was some other change. So okay. That's my point. So it's analogous, but you know, like all analogies, it's, there's a certain imperfection. And Hal Singer, are you attributing demand retraction to Title II? N no, no. I'm saying that uh, this decline in CapEx is an anomaly and that it's not being driven by a demand contraction. Uh, instead, what I think it's being driven by is a, a concern among the ISPs that these promises to forbear from the most onerous um, provisions of Title II could melt away uh, either with a change in political winds or, or whatever, and that, and that because of that, uh, they are uh, reluctant to invest at the same levels that they did previously. I, I, by the way, I, I disagree, Alan. I've talked about this before. I think they're, I, first of all, I would never just look at one quarter to draw a conclusion that's perfectly, I mean, I'm not saying there's something totally wrong about it, but I'm saying that's just not the way I, I would do it. Secondly, there are a lot of other things. Why Charter might be pulling back, or oh, does that have something to do with these 50 billion or whatever it is that they're spending on buying Time Warner, or you know, uh, why is it that AT&T pulled back, which by the way, I think they reversed themselves in some part. They had announced earlier that they were going to have a lower CapEx because they were finishing a project VIP, but also they spent an extra 10 billion on the AWS 3 auction, and of course, they were also spending a huge amount of money on DirecTV. Can I reply to that? Sure. Because uh, can I, but, I, but, but, but my primary point, and I, I, do, uh, I don't just show up at panels, I actually pay for the gig at you and the other stuff I'm doing by, by advising Wall Street on various issues. But one of the things Wall Street ta taught me is it, it's fundamentally about revenues and margins. And I don't see anything threatening those revenues and margins, and therefore I don't. Uh, you know, Hal is right, but I actually think Wall Street and the companies fundamentally know the, the FCC is not going to engage in retail price regulation and unbundling. And those are the two. If they did, you would see a much bigger pullback. But you actually haven't seen a pullback um, uh, in the in the stock prices attributable to Title II, and that's the reason why. So stock price I, and investment. We have a question here. Oh, can I can oh, I respond? Please to go ahead. Yeah, Blair, Blair is fond of saying that AT&T has reversed itself. It hasn't. In, in October 22nd, AT&T released its third quarter numbers, and AT&T is $3.5 billion down from, from where it was at this time uh, in 2014. Um, but I don't want to uh, make uh, too much out of AT&T's or any particular companies. It turned out that when I looked at the top seven, five of the seven went down in the first half, not in the first quarter, in the first half of 20. 15. But, um, did you adjust the numbers based on what Cable did the other day? I haven't updated for the third, for the third quarter yet, but I, I looked again and, and um, Charter is still way down. But here, here's the point, is let's not look at one particular uh, firm, because any firm can fluctuate from year to year. Let's sum up all of the investment 
uh, across whatever you think is a reasonable sample and compare what it is um, uh, prior to the Title II regime. That's how economists do things. We realize that a lot of things are going on that could also change what's happening, right? But what's important to me is that, one, the aggregate decline is big, and two, it's unprecedented with the exception of two demand-led recessions or contractions. One was the fiber glut uh, that, that, that where people realized that they were out, of, out ahead of demand and that they had to pull back. Uh, and then there was another, another recession, actual economic recession. But with, with those two exceptions, what we see is, is CapEx for the industry uh, rising year over year. And people are, why do they keep doing this? Well, they're like little hamsters on the trail. You can't, you can't get off the wheel when your rival is, is upgrading your, 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 right their network. And so you think that we're all going to be done with 4G. Well, what happens when your rival goes to 5G? You have to do it. It's, you have to do it too. And so um, I, I, I think that the expectation should be that, uh, that broadband CapEx, if we, don't, if we don't mess things up, should slowly increase uh, year over year. Um, okay. So introduce yourself. I'm Rob Pegarero. I write for Yahoo Tech, USA Today, The Wirecutter, a few other places. Um, this whole discussion is interesting because basically we have here a falsifiable hypothesis. At some point, we should have enough data to say that, yes, capital investment is down or, nope, it's resumed its growth. At what point would you two gentlemen concede that the other is right? How much data do you need to say, okay, Hal is correct on this, or nope, Blair had this right? Um, let's look at the numbers at the end of 2016. So, unfortunately, the DC Circuit's going to have to go uh, in December, right? Um, and uh, as an economist, I, I would hope that they would take this into consideration, this notion of cost-benefit analysis. The lawyers. Uh, my, my legal friends tell me that uh, the FCC might not be subject to the kind of rigorous cost-benefit standards that are, that are applied to other agencies. Um, and so if they're not, then, then this is all a bunch of economists blowing hot air. But um, uh, I, I think certainly you'd want to look uh, into 2015 and 2016 as well. So we'll schedule another sure. session like this in about a year. Well, I, I actually, there, there, there's a very specific reason I mentioned that. I think that, uh, and this kind of goes to something that Jim was saying earlier about what he sees uh, at the project level. I don't think we as a country actually are seeing um, the impact of a game of gigs yet. I don't think we'll see it till the end of 2016. Turns out it takes a long time for networks to be built. But I do believe that in 2016, we'll see something we haven't seen in a long time. You see it actually every day on, if you watch television every day, which is a marketing campaign between wireless providers. and. And it seems like every week another one is coming up with a different pricing plan. We haven't seen that kind of competition on the wired side. But in a certain select number of cities in 2016, we will see it. And I think that's where you, you know, and, and I think with AT&T committing to a very large number of fiber to the home, uh, and then we'll see the cable guys responding. We'll, we'll see. Okay. And I could be wrong. I, that's, yeah. what, what I, I do like the fact that I really enjoy chatting with Hal over the years and with Jim over the years. There are some people in Washington who simply have a narrative, and it doesn't matter what the facts are. The narrative is the important thing is to have a consistency of narrative. Uh, I'm precisely the opposite. The important thing is to continually challenge your own narrative uh, in, in face of new facts. And, and part of what I'm trying to do with this paper is saying, what are the, how are the facts different than they were five years ago? Well, we, we picked the three of you because you not only have a good sense of what's going on in the marketplace, you have the numbers, you have the recommendations, and you have the stories. And so I want to turn to Jim and get a few stories of where municipalities have really done something that has spurred growth of broadband in their region. Uh, do we have some, some cases around the country? Uh, we hear about Google Fiber, but there's a lot of other things going on out there. Um, let me see if I can twist your question a little bit so as to enable me to take a swipe at how. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, Hal, I want to take never, issue. No one's ever taken a swipe. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to take issue with your statement that uh, uh, municipal entry discourages private investment because no private entity will compete with an entity that does not maximize profits. Um, and I, I've got five answers to that question. Or to wow. that statement. The first one is that municipalities typically go to the private sector first and ask for 
uh, upgrades or entry to meet the needs of the community and don't go forward with a project if the private sector says yes. Once the municipalities do, in fact, invest, what we typically see are that all around the uh, community in question, rates continue to go up, service uh, remains at the levels that it does, but within the municipality where competition now exists, the incumbent rates go down or don't rise as fast, quality of service improves, and the environment to the residents of the uh, state of competition is, is better for everyone. Third point is that there have been hundreds of communities that have invested in one way or another in public broadband networks, several hundreds of them, and I'm aware of only two situations in the last 20 years in which a uh, private sector uh, entity sold its, sold its system to the municipality and left the market. Um, in most cases, what the private sector does is stays, improves their services. Uh, we have a statement, for example, from Comcast, from a representative of Comcast upon the entry of uh, Tacoma into the market that uh, their entry strengthened Comcast because it caused Comcast to improve its system and improve its services and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, now, when one talks about municipal investment, I think one also has to change what that investment profile is. We have seen across the country a surge of interest in public-private partnerships. And um, concomitantly, we see much less investment of a community alone. And the prob public-private partnerships take many different forms, but it's still a form of public investment as well as private investment. And I personally think that uh, uh, this is a, a trend that will continue to grow, particularly as we see successful endeavors of the public and private sectors working together. Can I respond? No. So I was, I was waiting for you, and I think I may have heard one, one anecdote that, that uh, spoke to my conjecture. Let me just say it again. The conjecture is that once the municipality goes, it could disincentivize uh, private entities from upgrading. And uh, this, by the way, isn't just a conjecture. There's a, there's a paper by David Sappington, Pretty, pretty famous uh, industrial organization economist that lays out the theory and then points to uh, examples uh, in regulated industries where this, where this has happened. Um, and so what I, was th what I was expecting you to say is I can think of five cities in which after the municipality went, the incumbent responded the way that they're responding to Google by upgrading their networks, right? I'm not hearing those stories. Blair tells a bunch of great anecdotal stories about almost every time that Google goes, the incumbent uh, is forced to respond with a faster network of their own. And what, I'm, my, what my conjecture is that you would see the opposite effect uh, where municipalities go because the, the private actor recognizes it doesn't take a PhD in economics that I don't want to be in a, I don't want to be in a campaign against this guy. Right? If he's going to cut rates below cost, why would I want to stick around? I also want to point out there's a study uh, by, the, uh, by a graduate student at the Mercatus Institute that showed that um, there was no appreciable uh, employment effect in cities that had uh, built up uh, municipal networks. And, um, and, I, uh, and, and the author gave some interesting examples as to why not. But, but again, if, if, if I'm right and it's disincentivizing private, then, then this author's results, that is no private sector employment effects, uh, would be consistent with the notion that what the municipality is doing is chasing away uh, private investment. Well, um, I'd encourage you to read a paper by George Ford, now with uh, Phoenix. Uh, and, and writing typically for um, uh, industry-oriented uh, uh, positions, but uh, he studied this phenomenon and uh, wrote a paper about a study he conducted in Florida indicating that um, uh, municipal investment, in fact, increases investment in the community. If you look at investment by all sectors, not just the, the telecom, uh, sector rather than drive capital out of the community. And, and we do see investment. Incumbents are, are not uh, giving up the ghost and saying if a municipality 
uh, invest. They're, they're going to lock up shop all across the country. There's investment happening. Cable companies everywhere are up, you know, they upgraded to DOCSIS 3.0 in Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, Cox made uh, Lafayette the very first place where it rolled out DOCSIS 3.0, and there are examples of that uh, all across the board. Um, it is indeed hard to track the economic development effects of broadband investments of any kind, public or otherwise, uh, but we've published a paper with 17 case histories of uh, uh, examples of how communities benefited, increased jobs and otherwise, from the public investment that occurred in a, in a municipal network. So we have yes, no. Blair, do you want to be a tiebreaker here? Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'll break the tie in this way. Uh, I would say if I were in Congress, I would vote to, for a law to preempt any state from restricting municipalities. If I were on a city count, if I was in the state legislature, I'd vote against any law restricting cities. If I were on a city council, I would always threaten to do it, and I would almost certainly vote against almost any any actual. In other words, I see it very much in the kind of negotiating realm, and I think. You know, ba basically, my view is, the, as I said, the point of public policy is to drive abundant bandwidth. Um, the state laws that are restricting it, uh, you know, give us worse or more expensive, slower bandwidth, and, and therefore I think a city should have the right. However, I, th this actually, I would just say two things. First of all, in the year 2011 and 12, those years, I spent a lot of time going to cities, talking about Gig at You and meeting with various people and we were planning this thing. Um, two things were almost inevitably true. Number one, as shortly after I left, like within 24 hours, the incumbent telco and cable operator would call up the mayor and say, what can we do for you today? You know, I mean, <laughs> in other words, and the same thing was true of my friend Milo Medin, who was then running Google Fiber. I mean, if you published, we were joking, if you tr published our travel schedules, you may, we might get the upgrade where we're working. But that was in response to a private entity Well, coming but it in, was right? also, the, 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 it was not clear what we were doing because we were agnostic on the, the gig that you, none of the projects actually involved real municipal broadband as the term is often known. But it does involve certain municipal actions. It just doesn't involve the investments. But, I, but there are certain projects that I'm actually quite fond of where the city is doing certain kinds of infrastructure like laying dark fiber and then leasing it to the private sector mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I'm just saying, I, I'm actually publishing a blog at Brookings in a week or two uh, talking about the four different kinds of communities, those that either can or, or will probably get Google, big cities that have scale and staff but will never get Google, smaller communities like a lot of the gig.u communities, and then really rural that don't have scale and don't have density. But there are examples in each of these where cities have successfully uh, gotten broadband. Um, what I was going to say, the, the second thing that, that is almost true, always true, is when mayors really think about the difficulties of doing this, most of the ones I dealt with did not want to do a pure municipal project. Very difficult to attract talent, to run it, subject to kind of techno technological risk that city projects usually aren't. And you need to raise money that's fundamentally different than the money. I used to actually be a bond lawyer, raising money for a parking lot or a sewer system. Cities know how to do that. Raising money for a more um, um, for for a business that is changing with technology that is much tougher. But that's a legitimate debate. I debate people on it all the time. And if I, you know, depending on what city you're mayor of, you might have a different point of view on it. By the way, your your point on uh, what it means to have the ability to step away from the table and the impact that can have. Uh, is almost identical to a point that Franklin Delano Roosevelt made in a very famous speech in Portland, Oregon, in 1932 when he was running for president on local choice as his platform. So I know I stole that from somewhere. I <laughs> <laughs> so you just I brought up. There's another question behind oh. you. Okay, I, just, I had a question about presidential politics since you just mentioned Roosevelt. I've been surprised in this campaign that so far we haven't seen a lot of talk about broadband and the next generation of technology and all the great things we could do with the government. Do you have any explanation for that? We, we've had a l little talk of net neutrality, but in terms of talking about the vision, which Clinton did, Obama did, there was a lot of talk about what we could do if we really wired the world, the country, or wired the world. I don't really think we saw that in the campaigns. 
Pardon me? I'm, I'm not sure we saw that in the campaigns, but I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. And I'll say, look, I, 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 I think everybody in Washington, D.C., at the end of October ought to recognize that whatever they thought about this presidential campaign in June did not turn out to be true. So, like, <laughs> what do we know? We're all idiots. But, but I would simply say one of the things that's really striking to me is this does seem to be a certain kind of what I think professionals refer to as a grievance election. That is to say, the, the candidates who are doing well are those who articulate grievances. Grievances are fundamentally backwards looking. And that, I think, creates a great opening, if someone knew how to do it, for a forward looking candidate yeah. to say, here's how we, you know, you, you, uh, you, you got to love Trump's slogan, make America great again. Uh, he, you know, he keeps talking about how we're losing in the world in which I operate. It seems like America is winning everything in the world. But, but okay, you know, I'm, I'm looking at a small piece of it. Uh, but the point is, he is backward looking in how he talks about, let's make America great again. My response yeah. is, is, is in two parts. First of all, at the local level, this is a nonpartisan issue. Most of the communities that have developed networks have done it for economic development. That's the single most important consideration that cited. Most of those communities vote Republican, many heavily so. So at the local level, this is not a partisan issue at all. At the national level, Hillary Clinton last week declared that she was in favor of preemption of state barriers supports network neutrality, is opposed to uh, monopolies in, in this area. Uh, I, I, in a perfect world, we would like to see municipal or local choice, local choice even more so than any particular exercise of that choice, yeah. be a nonpartisan issue at the federal level. But because Hillary has said something, there will undoubtedly be others taking a different view of it, and uh, hopefully we can have a constructive conversation about local choice at the national level as well. Thanks. Yeah, I'll yeah. just note that, uh, oh, can no, I no, know no, while you're while no, while you're no, uh, yeah, Hillary uh, in, her, in her blog in, in Quartz said that uh, three quarters of Americans are beholden to a monopoly provider. I don't know where she got that stat from. I, I, I know very, where she got that stat. It was, it was, really very, it was very provocative. No, I, I, <laughs> it wasn't true, it was provocative. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether to blame Eric Garr or Steve Rosenberg, or I, I'm mentioning people on the plan who are friends, and we've been chatting about this. Uh, when we did a slide presentation in September of '09, and we had 150 slides, it was a four-hour meeting. We were actually trying to get a factual basis before we went to do policy analysis and re make recommendations. The slide I worried most about was this slide. It was I can't remember which number it was. But it said, at different speeds, you have different numbers of choices. Factually unobjectionable. But what I worried about, what everyone would say is, oh my god, he's setting up for unbundling, or we're, we're, you're setting up for some kind of price regulation, which was not the point. We were simply making a very important point that at 25 and above, 75% of Americans had only one choice, which is about the number it is today, roughly speaking. But anyway. It turned out nobody noticed that slide because of the slide everybody focused on was the one that said if we want to get all Americans 100 megabits, it'll cost $300 billion. We and noticed the slide and blasted it all over the country. Well, other people, but, but, but there was absolutely nothing written about it. But Tom Wheeler picked it up in last September. Um, Salat picked it up. Bear picked it up. The president picked it up. But why it took four years for people to pick it up, that's an interesting question, which I will not discuss. But, but, but it, it was. It was an interesting case where, at, at a particular moment in time, some things get picked up. I would say I think that that 75, this is what I mean about the difference between today, you know, look where the puck is going. A couple of years from now, that, that slide will, will be obsolete. But you're saying that it's, it hasn't changed that much in the four years? I no, I don't think it has. I don't think it's a 75 percent. Uh, I saw the slide because, because uh, Chairman Wheeler used it at a speech in 1776. Yeah. And it's not 75%. I think it was something like 50-something percent. But it was, it was already dated by the time that he gave it. It was a stat 
as of 2013 or something. That, like that. It may be true because of the, uh, the U-verse stuff. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know that. But, but it hey, will change dramatically, I think, in the next two years. Well, factoids well, are numbers, dangerous. It gets the people going. Then you'll find right. a higher number. Yeah, of course. We have and, to, and we'll have to redefine it. Well, right. but, but, but look, at the, and this is why I say we need two networks that basically have abundant bandwidth where you're making changes on the electronics, not on the trenching. And once you get there, I think we'll be in pretty good shape. Okay. <laughs> All right. I asked this question as a member of either that 50% or Blair's 5%. Um, I'd like... To ask you guys, you know, to kind of think about comparing um, areas or localities where there's lack of competition or one ISP or one wireline to areas with municipal broadband. In those areas, is investment in infrastructure, how does that compare, and how does the rate that consumers pay for, you know, per megabit of, of bandwidth compare? Yeah, let's focus on the price side first, because that's the one that's most immediate. Well, I'm not. Uh, I'm. I'm. I, I know a lot about the communities I've worked with. I, I have, I'm not going to do studies, but I will tell you this. Um, one of the things that's really interesting and amusing is uh, we are creating a new digital divide, but it's not the digital divide that people think about wealth or even density. Uh, I pointed out the other day in a speech I was giving at Natoa that the big digital divide is between Starkville, Mississippi, a fundamentally rural town, and Bethesda, Maryland, a much wealthier place where I live, or Beverly Hills, or Westchester County. Starkville has two gigabit options at a lower price than I would pay for, for like 50 megabits. And the reason is, is because C Spire went there and incumbent upgraded. And what you see in the uh, Google what Google is, is basically telling us is by the end of 2016, 17, there are going to be a number of communities that have three options. Now, there are a number for, a, for an affordable gig. Most of the two, couple hundred communities that Jim is talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, are fundamentally rural communities who really don't have choices. I don't, that's not an area that I tend to work in. But my point is there are different ways of getting up the mountains. But what you all, what you're going to see in a couple of years, is you're going to have communities where you're paying about 70 bucks for a gig, which makes it really pretty damn hard to sell 50 megabits at 100 bucks. So you're going to have downward pressure on pricing in those communities. And indeed, Google also offers a very low entry level price. It's very different, right? They they just offer two two places where uh, two price points, whereas the incumbents have a bunch. They're pricing differently in a more traditional manner when you have scarce goods to get to kind of the profit maximizing point. And there's nothing illegal or immoral or wrong about that. But it's really cool when you attack with an asymmetric asset base and an asymmetric incentives because you change the pricing dynamic. What about... Well, what, what I would say is Every community has an opportunity to improve its situation, but this, there are four very distinct strategies, in my view. That's a longer issue, but uh, there is no community that I'm aware of that is out of the game. It's just a question of whether they want to organize to be in the game. So, Jim? Just as a matter of fact, um, pricing strategies of communities that have networks are all over the place depending on their particular philosophy. Some believe that they are the people and should charge the, the customer base the lowest that they can charge consistent with keeping their networks upgraded and paying for service and so on and so forth. Their philosophy is that the more money they leave in the community, the more it can circulate in the community, paying for haircuts and soccer cleats and, and uh, uh, other communities don't compete at all on price and are higher than the private sector price, but their approach is to compete on quality of service, um, friendliness. This, this is particularly true of those communities that are out of the tradition of providing their own electric utilities. Uh, they, they filled gaps in the market a century ago and and carry forward the same philosophy into the communications area, and then there's everything in between. So there's there's no particular 
pricing strategy that I, I'm aware that could be called the dominant strategy. It's, it's a matter of local decision making, what works for that particular community. Okay. Uh, my name is Will Reinhardt, American Action Forum. Uh, I actually did do one of those studies looking at the overall prices that were uh, for each of the different municipal uh, services. And even though I need to go back and do it again with a more robust uh, regression analysis, my initial findings was about 20 to 50 percent higher. Now, of course, there's other issues that obviously need to be taken into consideration. What was 20 to 50 percent higher? 20 to 50 percent higher uh, for municipal broadband uh, prices per megabyte, as compared. Prices were. Yes, as okay. compared to, and, and I use the, I, you know, I, I can show you this this later if you're interested. But I, you know, I went through uh, about 100, and, I think there's 140 uh, consumer-facing municipal broadband projects. Uh, a very significant portion of them actually are more on the business side. So. Uh, I was only just looking at consumers, uh, consumer side in that in that regard, um, as compared to two indexes uh, or three indexes that I had. So I looked at the price that uh, what is it uh, OTI? I think they do a pr uh, paper almost every single year looking at average prices over over cities. So I used that, and then I also used the Ookla. Ookla has an average price uh, uh, index as well. So I, I can send you this information if you're interested in it. Uh, so, I mean, we've talked a lot about demand, or sorry, we've talked a lot about supply today and supply issues. I was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit more about demand. The reason I asked this is because George Ford in another paper actually did a very interesting study looking at uh, stochastic frontier analysis. So he did an OLS model, you know, really simple regression, then took another look at it through stochastic frontier analysis. And he, I don't know if he necessarily proved, but he at least indicates that a significant portion of uh, broadband speeds, I think it was on broadband speeds, is connected specifically to the demand side. And the one thing that he points out in the paper is that, you know, for all of the benefits of them, you know, that, that occur in the U.S., one of the really big uh, problems in the U.S. is that our consumption of computers is, in fact, very, very low, and that you actually have a broad variability of, um, of consumers on the very bottom end, which you do not have in other countries, specifically in Western Europe. So. He, he, in, in that paper specifically, he said that he is at least, he sees it more, much more of a demand issue than, than a supply issue. And I was just wondering if the, the panel could talk a little bit more about demand problems. This is much more on the, the, the you know, uh, digital divide, which I, we haven't really talked about, and it kind of opens up a can of worms, but it's also the other side of it, which Hal talked a little bit about. Yeah, I'll talk a bit. I mean, Brian Fung did a nice piece in, in Washington Post recently looking at the demand factors. And of course, there are some folks out there that, that for which uh, for whom price is just not an issue, right? And and there are different strategies that you need to do to try to um, increase their demand for, for broadband. But there is a healthy chunk uh, for which uh, price is the impediment. Uh, and if that's the case, um, I think that um, you know we should move aggressively to try to try to bridge the divide between what what the suppliers can sell at and what the, what these households can afford. And uh, and I do think that if you can increase the expected penetration rate among entrants. I mean, this is the, this is the fundamental problem. The Wall Street Journal is, is going crazy about this, how cable seems to be gobbling up, in terms of new subscribers, cable seems to be gobbling up a disproportionate share of new subscribers. You're probably familiar with, with these stats. And of course, if... if um, That's because television is so much better than it used to be. <laughs> I don't know about that, but whatever it is, if, you, if you're an entrant and you're sitting there and, and you're watching uh, the new subscribers go up you know, to the cable, um, it's going to affect your expected penetration level, and that in turn is going to affect your incentive to want to make the plunge. And um, and and I think that that uh, we could solve perhaps two two problems with one stone here if we if we think hard about a broadband subsidy, an end user subsidy, that would that would bring in somewhere between 10 and, and 20 million new homes. That could make investment look. That could alter the investment calculus. Uh, for entrance in a, in a way that I think would be very positive. We have to get you in touch with one of the presidential candidate speech writers. Ms. Blair? <laughs> um, uh, first of all, I really appreciate uh, there, there's there, Whenever you do these things, there's two kinds of criticism. There's the kinds of where you go, oh, God, that's so stupid. And then there's the kind where you go, well, that's thoughtful. And I think that that, that is a thoughtful point uh, about it. I'll tell you why I don't address it here, but except to say, and there's a footnote in the written thing, that there is a vision about bandwidth abundance that I've had for some time. I think things like e-rate reform, lifeline reform, connected home are all totally consistent with that. 
And I, real, I think you know Wheeler deserves a lot of credit for what he did on E-rate. Uh, hopefully, the commission will do uh, help bring Lifeline into the 21st century. Um, I think what could connect at home. I think these things are really good. I, what, what I was focused on was how do you drive an upgrade? And I would say that if you were to, putting aside Google Fiber and GigU and the other kind of the three level levers I talked about, you take them out of the equation and you add a number of new subscribers, that would be very good for the country. And I'm, I would be in favor of that. It's not going to happen, but I would, but at least Hal and I would be in favor of a general subsidy to bring more people online. Um, uh, but I don't think you change the competitive dynamic. That doesn't necessarily lead AT&T to want to upgrade because they get those people, because they're more likely to get those people because they're going to be kind of the Walmart in this equation. It's kind of the Walmart versus Bloomingdale's and the country, you know, most new buyers are going to Bloomingdale's apparently. So that's, that's kind of the challenge. And I would just say that what, what I'm kind of looking for is that situation where we have what we have with long distance voice where you know, most people in this room can remember where you actually thought about making a long distance call, but our kids don't ever think about it. And so how do you, how do you create bandwidth abundance that drives the price and the value to a point where nobody thinks about it? But it's a, it's a, it's a very worthwhile debate, and, and I certainly appreciate those who say, and they said this at the beginning, okay, got you. why are you wasting your time doing this? We ought to be focused on how do you get 90% on, and your point about computers is right, which is that part of the reason we have lower adoption in Western Europe is we have lower adoption of computers. But that's just not where I was focused with this paper and with some of the work I've done. Can I, first of all, just to distinguish, um, th this is really important actually, it's where are you going to finance the subsidy, right? And if you do it under the Lifeline program, you're, you're financing it on the backs of the broadband bill, right? Now, can you imagine? Um, actually, you're not, but that's a bit, but you, eventually no, you, you get you are, that. you are. You impose the fee on the provider and the provider turns around and puts it on your broadband bill. Now, now look, which is exactly how they do it for voice, as you know, the Interlata uh, services on voice. Now, right, but, me, but it's the same factor right now. Okay. It's the same. Right. Level. So let, let, me, let, me, let me just finish this. Can you imagine if we said we all recognize that general R&D uh, is underprovided because of positive spillovers in the economy, and, and we want to subsidize it, let's tax uh, producers of general R&D, right? You'd think I was crazy. I mean, I'd be laughing at it, and yet that's the way that... That's the way that we're heading on the Lifeline plan. But not only is it, is it perverse in the sense that you're going to raise the price uh, of, of broadband service with federal fees, as soon as the government goes, as soon as the federal government goes, we're waiting for this board decision, and Commissioner Rosenworcel said we're going to delay the vote until after the, you know, the D.C. Circuit. And my interpretation of this is that um, they are concerned that if they vote and we get new federal USF fees that attach to, to the, our broadband bill, then the preemption... That, that was put into the 2014, 2015 Open Internet Order. Mm -hmm. it's, in the, it's in the 400s, four, paragraph 470 something. Just do a search for preemption. The FCC preempted the states from moving forward with their own um, uh, USF fees unless and until the federal government moved forward with theirs and they noted that the joint board was deciding. This preemption goes away as soon as, as, soon as, the, as, soon as the FCC and the feds in, move with their own broadband tax, right? So, so the second wave that's going to hit consumers are, fed, are state fees. And, and fortunately, I've got the Vermont uh, head of uh, chairman of the Telecommunication Task Force saying that he's champing at the bit. He's champing at the bit to go uh, with a state-based fee, but he can't do it right now because of the preemption. Okay. Can I, can I just say, we're, oh, I'm sorry. So, Jim? Um, I think that we're talking about two important issues that don't necessarily coincide. Um, it is important to enhance adoption and use at one end of the spectrum, but at the same time we have an upper end challenge that also needs to be met. Uh, we, in our preparation for this, we talked about whether to get into international comparisons or not. I won't get into comparisons with, with Europe, but China has gone from nowhere to, at the very least, half the world's fiber connections at this point. And we can't, like the Chinese government, declare that all new connections shall be fiber. But if we're going to remain a great country, we have to find our own ways to be competitive at the upper end as well. So uh, while it is critically important that we focus on adoption at all levels, 
we can't lose sight of the need to find ways to invest in upper end uh, advanced communications networks. Okay. I, I would just make the point, I, this, the point you're making is really about the contribution factor and the way we do it and the way it might transition. And I would just say, I'm, I actually, like most economists would, I mean, I'm not an economist, but, but, but at the Aspen Institute every summer we have this session and we have a bunch of economists, all of whom always recommend that USF be funded by general taxes, and, and that makes total economic sense. That's why we never get invited back to cocktail parties. Right. <laughs> uh, but I, I would note that the majority of the, of the Universal Service Fund goes to fund networks, and nobody would fund a network if it thought it was subject to an annual congressional appropriation. So I think Kyle is making an important point, but I think, you know, as we think about the, the political reality of these things, network funding, anchor institution funding, and low income funding are kind of three different buckets. Well, that goes back to my equation about uncertainty. Yeah. Political right. uncertainty being even greater than But it's particularly true regulatory when you're talking uncertainty. about CapEx right. as opposed to an OPEX. Okay. We have lunch waiting for us, and I think people are eager to try out what's waiting for us, but I would like to give you each the opportunity to summarize your critical point, the take home message in a tweet. So if you have, I, I, heard, I heard Jim's tweet, which was, watch out for China. <laughs> <laughs> but do you have another, another simple one sentence that you'd like to just leave people with? Um, I support local choice. And I believe that at the local level, this is a nonpartisan issue. And we'd love to see it nationwide, a nonpartisan issue. That was 156 characters. Very good. <laughs> Blair? Uh, I actually, I, th I don't think I have a good tweet. That's why it took me 4,500 words in the written version. Uh, but, but I would just say uh, it's about the plumbing. That's even shorter. And that shorter. we have to focus, actually, one of the things I said in the written paper is a lot of people in politics make what I think of as the fundamental aspiration error. The fundamental attribution error is the correlating cause, you know, outcome with uh, uh, in time, but the aspiration error is to think that you've actually done something if you stayed an aspiration. Mm -hmm. It's really about plumbing. Yeah. And your paper is available in its entirety with the slides at our website, isoc-dc.org. So the last word is yours, or the last numbers if you want to use some numbers. A tweet? In your tweet. Do I have to do it? Okay. You have make to do 140 us. characters. How about make love, not war? Uh, <laughs> end, the, end the war uh, in the telecosm, and let's let's find a a compromise on net neutrality that, that Congress can support and move about our, our business. Okay. Thank you very much, and we'll have conversation over lunch. Thank you very much. That was great fun. Thank you. That was fun. Yeah. And I hope I did.